What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Self Made Web Designer Podcast. You know, in the course of learning things like HTML and CSS, you have to do a lot of Googling. You got to search the internet for all the reasons why what should be working in your code just doesn't seem to be working. And you have to try to keep yourself from just throwing your computer against the wall. When I was first getting started, there were a few lifelines in websites and forums that helped me figure out solutions to the problems that I faced, the things that I had a hard time troubleshooting, the bugs that I couldn't get rid of in my code. And one of those lifelines was CSS Tricks. And that's run by an awesome guy. His name is Chris Coyier. He's got an amazing first name, uh, if I do say so myself. Shout out to all the people still making Chris jokes in the 2020s. Uh, but Chris is a fantastic guy and we had a great chat. We talked about all things front end web development. We talked about the future of careers when it comes to the tech space. And we talked about what he's been up to in the midst of the quarantine, the lockdown, and all that's going on in this season. I know you're going to love the conversation that Chris and I had. Chris and Chris, the two Chrises, you can't go wrong. So without further ado, here is Mr. Chris Coyier. Well, hey, Chris, thank you so much for being on the Self Made Web Designer Podcast. Really appreciate it, man. Yeah. Hey, thanks for having me on. I think it's one of the the, the finest names of a podcast <laughs> out there. I like that. Self-made web designer. Yeah. I feel like I'm that to some degree. Absolutely. Absolutely you are. And I, I think most people listening to this would probably know who you are based on your credentials and things that you've built. Um, but maybe take some time and, and tell us about your journey and, and web design, where you came from and where you are today. Sure, sure, sure. I mean, I can start with right now, just in case that does line up with anybody who happens to know me. I, you know, you'd be surprised. You know, they say it's like whatever, being a famous dentist, right? Nobody, <laughs> you don't know. Nobody knows anybody really, you know. But I do a couple of things. If you're a web designer, you may have come across me just because perhaps in your early days or maybe in your day-to-day -day work, you Google something about CSS. Google has been good to me with my site CSS Tricks, which is such a cheesy name. Sorry about that. But I did it, you know, it's like 13, 14 years ago or something. I was buying that domain name and I was just blogging about CSS. And, uh, you know, that was my goal was to, you know, legit like publish CSS tricks. But it just was so much fun to write and not, you know, it, it just turned into a blog just about building websites. So, you know, that's a long time, 13, 14 years. But, but these days, that's just what it is. And I feel like most people aren't particularly confused by it now. If you read my site, CSS Tricks, it's just about building websites. And I try to talk about CSS as much as I can, but I might publish a post that's just about WordPress or something, or, you know, it's just about, it has a little bit about backend development, or, you know, I talk about JavaScript all the time. You know, I talk about building websites, but from a practitioner point of view, from a, you know, I literally build stuff and I'm talking to other people that build websites directly. And it's kind of an intermediate level thing. I don't, I, I really like publishing beginner style stuff, but I don't as much. If I just writing any old blog post on CSS Tricks is kind of like targeted at, I'm not going to stop and explain what border radius is or what a div is or something. I kind of like assume some kind of base level knowledge about, about web design there. So that's me. I run CSS Tricks. I have a part-time staff too. Jeff is our editor. He does an amazing job of, of, of editing content and wrangling advertisers and hitting the publish button on stuff and maintaining the schedule. You know, very cool. That, and then I have some guest writers that, that write. And, and some of them are like on staff that write regularly. And some of them are uh, just, you write into me and say, hey, I got an idea for a post. So p podcast listeners of the Self-Made Web Designer Podcast, feel free to, if you have an idea of something that you really want to blog about related to web design, I'd love to hear from you because that's, that's at least half of our content, I'd say, is... Uh, is guest writers and stuff. So that's CSS tricks, and it's 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 a business, you know. It's it's part of my income. It's probably somewhere around half, maybe a little less than that, um, because I sell ads on it. It's pretty much the whole business model is is sponsorship and advertising, you know. Uh, 
thank gosh for that. You know, that's a, it's a volatile market, but we try to do a good job over time. And that, and you really got to shift around, change with, change with the times as that stuff changes. But that's an, you know, that's another show perhaps. So that's half of it. Then I run this other company, Code Pen, a little bit newer, but still pretty old, going on eight years. That's kind of like a playground for front end development. So that, you know, they're highly related and they, they have a lot to do with each other, but Code Pen is a separate, a separate thing, um, which is much larger in scope overall because you know we have a whole staff of full-time people that work on CodePen and I have a co-founder at CodePen and uh, it has pro plan so it also has sponsorship and advertising stuff that's how it's a business but that's a lot smaller of a percentage the the bulk of CodePen is selling pro plan it's a freemium product you know there's you can use it for free or you can upgrade for additional features that's uh that's code pen and a designer might use it you know a listener to this podcast might end up there because they're searching for something or they might use it to build out a little demo of their own to to play around they might search around on code pen to find examples of something when they want to build show me cool buttons show me interesting tabs how do people do this in react uh, you know that kind of stuff and then I have a podcast as well called Shop Talk Show, and that's been around a long time too. I feel good about that. All my projects have are, are 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 getting old, and I feel like that's good because that's that's where I excel as a person is like is like keeping doing things for a long time, you know, like success through determination, essentially. Code Pen Shop Talk Show. Uh, CSS tricks. Those are my my things. And I just have to thank you for all of your work in CSS tricks, Code Pen, and Shop Talk Show, because I am a follower of all of those things. CSS tricks was like a lifeline for me when I was first getting started. So thank you for the work that you have put into that. Because I know you know it's doing it for this long is not easy, and uh, it takes a lot of determination. I, I wonder if you could speak to people who are maybe just starting to dip their toes into web design, front end development, um, and are trying to find their way and just trying to figure out, is this the right thing for me? And how do I know if I should throw in the towel or keep going? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, you know, and I, I, I don't know for sure. I can say that the reason I stuck with it I think is that for one, there was a little bit of a feedback loop from me is that I would work on it. Uh, well, let me start with the idea that do, do you just get a kick out of it? Do you just like it anyway? Can you tell that working on this stuff is kind of fun for you, that you find yourself thinking about it during off periods or you find yourself not dreading doing more work of it because it's because, you, you know, you just like I said, you just get a kick out of it. That's a great sign, you know, and that was me like I was doing it because I wanted to do it because I find this stuff highly satisfying. Uh, I find it to be like problem solving, you know, like, like I get to, I get to do puzzles all day in a way and I get to do all kinds of puzzles. I feel like design is a puzzle in itself, trying to figure out what works best and what doesn't. Development is certainly a puzzle. How do I pull this stuff off? Business is a puzzle. How do I make more money from this? How do I measure this kind of stuff? You're constantly doing puzzles. It's almost ruined video games for me. It's like, I don't, this is, why am I like running errands for this kid, like collecting chickens for him or something when I, you know, I get the same satisfaction from solving puzzles and the other stuff I do. No, I, not entirely. I still play some video games too, but uh, I think of it that way. So, so, but that's, you know, is sort of fueled by how much time I've put into it now. Like I get satisfied, you know, here, here's what, what I meant by feedback loop is I can write a blog post and I know that people read it and they'll react to it. I'll see tweets about it. I'll see comments come into the website. I'll see other people share it. That's, that's like addictive. Like if you get to that, like that's a, you know, if you can get to that point, that's amazing. If you, if writing feels good to you and you can start that feedback loop getting started, I mean, it's hard to stop. So, so that it's easier these days, but then how, how do you get that going? You know, that's harder, you know, like the very first blog post you ever write, you know, maybe you'll strike gold and, and, and it'll be highly read and shared and stuff and you'll get going right away. But there, you know, there's a chance that it won't. And there's a chance that it won't because you really haven't put in the time yet. You're not that good of a writer yet, you know? <laughs> So, you know, we'll see. Maybe you have a natural talent for it or not. But so if you're if you're early in this thing, do you think it's kind of fun anyway? You know, I you know, the, the other side of this is that you're in this career now and now now is interesting because we're dealing with all this coronavirus stuff. So there is a little bit of a surge of 
activity in our interest of like, gosh, if I had that job, I could do it from home. So there's that going on. But aside from that, because hopefully there's an end date to that, uh, you know, we'll see. It's probably going to change the world forever and in some ways, but there'll probably be somewhat of a return to, 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 to normalcy in a way. Even aside from that, there's this desire to get into tech because it's high paying and it's not particularly stressful. You know, I know people that are like, gosh, I'm in finance and this job is crazy. I'm working crazy hours and I'm, uh, you know, a lot is expected of me. It's highly stressful. And I work right alongside some developers who roll in at nine 30 in the morning, take a long lunch, never get out of their sweatpants kind of stuff. And they make just as much money or more as I do. And that's been happening for a while now to the point where like we've seen this phenomenon happen of code schools get started. Lots of people getting educated up in this because this job is, there's a lot of demand for it. It's a highly desirable job. And so the industry starting to flood with people coming out of these, these code schools and things. And it's going to start to normalize to some degree. But, but tech is so big that it, it, I don't think it has yet. What would you say to the person who is looking at stepping in now and sees, man, everybody is going for tech? How do they differentiate themselves and stand out so they don't just become another person in the pile of people looking to get into it? Yeah, that sounds daunting, but I don't think it really is. I think the bar is pretty low. I mean, like, you know, there's a couple of, of things that just set you apart immediately, like writing a, a f- intelligible email. My God, you know how many emails I get that are just garbage? I hate to say it to people, but they just, they can't, they're not saying what they need to say. They just have no communication skills at all. Like it feels rude, but it's like, Mike, where did you learn this? It's unbelievable. Be able to just communicate normally, like a, just, just say what you need to say and deliver the context you need to deliver and then bring that attitude to everything else that you need to do. The people that you work with, the people you're interviewing with, just be yourself and, and deliver the situation in your, and what's on your mind, how you're approaching problems. Uh, and all that, just just that alone will set you just so far above. I, it's just amazing. I, I don't think the bar is very high, especially if you can just do some de- decent work too. If you have a decent level of taste, you know, I hope that you have that. I hope that's what's driven you to be a web designer, you know, that's listening to this podcast. Design, you know, is about problem solving. It's about all this, but there's an element of aesthetics to it and stuff. I'm sure you were drawn to it perhaps, you know, from an artistic sensibility, you know, work on your like level of taste. Try not to be too satisfied with the things that you create, you know, and build and, and, and do it a lot too. I feel like there's a lot of people that sit around and wait for work to do. They're like, gosh, I'd love to build a website, but nobody's hired me to build one, so I can't possibly, you know, oh, gosh. <laughs> there's a million websites you could make, you know? I know it's a little bit of a bummer making websites for free, but, you know, in your early days, <laughs> it's it's just a form of practice, you know? I play my banjo for free, that's how I get better at it, you know? Inevitably, when, when you're first starting, you have a sense of what looks good or maybe what works well with the front end development and things like that. But you have a hard time putting language to it or getting real into the nitty gritty or producing it yourself. So there, there comes that bump of frustration where you're like, what I would like this to look like, I'm not able to get it there. So, you know, you've had a, quite a few projects that have a, a good amount of years underneath them. What has helped you to get over those bumps from going from being a, a halfway decent coder to a really good coder, halfway decent writer, halfway decent web devi- designer to being, you know, someone at, who's at the peak of their game? What advice would you give to people in that scenario? It was only through... Like nobody demanded it of me necessarily, you know, it was just like, and I didn't even demand it of myself really, but I think there is some level of that, like try not to be too satisfied with the stuff that you make or be too proud of yourself for the things because you can always, you got a project, you should be proud of yourself to some degree, but you can always look around and see somebody that, that did something cooler than you did. That's good motivation. Be like, you know, I'm happy with, with, with what I made. Heck yeah. Pat yourself on the back. You did it. But you know, it's like not, not that it's not 
peak. You know, I'm constantly looking at, at the work of others and being like, I am trash compared to them. I can't. How did you get that good? That's crazy. You know, uh, uh, so yeah, I think you'll always have the, ho- hopefully that that's, you know, a, a natural feeling for you. And if it's not, you know, I, I'd say that's worth working on, you know. Uh, you know, train yourself to not be so happy with your, you know, to, to think everything you do is awesome because it's not, I promise. And, uh, <laughs> and, and then it's just the, the reason I got any good, if I am any good, I, I, I do feel quite mediocre. I mean, just working with my own team on CodePen, you know, Rachel, Stephen, Claire, Marie, they're a super talented people. That that when we sit down to work on something, I just have to stand back and watch them. They literally are better than me at at web design and development, and not in absolutely every quality. Like I have qualities that have gotten me where I am, and I hope that I can still am good and you know bring certain skills to the table that help kind of steer these ships to the right places through experience and stuff. But you know. I'm not that amazing at it. And any talent I have is just through doing it a lot. Because I just build a lot of websites. Not a day goes by that I don't write some HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. I'm a front-end guy, and I write a lot of it all the time. All the time. You know, and I think... A lot of, especially if you're a designer, right? Like more on the artistic spectrum of things, you you have a hard time not taking critique or feedback personally, um, you, you know, because it's like, this is your baby. This is who you are. And you're like giving it to the world. And then somebody says a negative thing and it, and it crushes you. So h- h- how have you figured out how to, how to get past that and not identify your own worth <laughs> with what you're producing as a web designer or front end developer? Yeah, that's tricky. Cause if somebody says something that's rude, it's like, you sh- I don't know, you should feel bad. Like they're trying to make you, that's just, they're just being an asshole, you know, like, uh, then you'll have to like be like, oh, that person is an asshole. So hopefully, hopefully you can like start developing some thick skin around around some of that stuff because that's a skill too. That is like very hard to ever get good at that. You know, if I receive a, some scathing critique from someone, I shouldn't have used the word critique either because that's an important distinction. If somebody is critiquing what you're doing, that's good. And if you like find offense in being critiqued. That's a skill that you definitely need to work on. And that does need to be worked on. That's what they teach you in art school. I literally have an art degree. Not that I'm like that good at it or like gained like incredible insight from it. But we did critiquing was part of the curriculum. Every single class, the spirit of it, you know, was work on this project. Then we're going to all get together and we're all going to critique each other's stuff. And the critique was rarely just like, I love it, it's amazing, ship it. That's not what critique is. The critique is, oh, I see what you're going for here, but look, there is a kind of a problem here. I'm, I'm feeling like this part isn't working here. And, you know, like, that's the thing. They're not trying to hurt your feelings. They're almost trying to make you feel good. They're trying to say, I care about what you've made here. I want it to be better. I want to give you frank feedback on what's happening here so that we can all improve from it. That's not that's not something that hopefully that you should walk away from and just feel dejected, you know? You should feel dejected when somebody's being an asshole to you and then hopefully eventually re- reach some incredible level of enlightenment where you realize that for what it is and can just wave it off or walk away or something that you know, that's for that's for monks, I feel like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Some people look at front end as like the stepping stone to back end or to some type of other programming career or expertise, but you've really kind of honed in on, on front end. So, so talk about the motivation there and maybe even for some of our listeners who don't really understand the difference between the two, maybe what sets front end and back end apart. Sure, sure. I think that's still kind of a problem. There is, you know, front end has meaning. It means that, you know, the, is the front end is what you see. You know, it's like the browser. I think front end, if you're a front end person, you're a browser person. That's what it means. And you you deal with stuff that happens in the browser. That's gotten tricky over the years because there's so much of it that it's hard for any one person to know. So you're going to be a specialist of some kind, even if you're just a front end person. I didn't mean to say just a, but you're focused on front end. You're probably going to know some parts of it and not some other stuff. 
even if you end up being great at the core technologies, which I think is a great way to go. If you're great at HTML, CSS, even great at JavaScript too, you're still going to have holes. Maybe you don't know that much about accessibility. You just and that that's like a whole spectrum. It's happening in the browser. It's still a front end thing, but you don't know that much about it, or you don't know that much about performance, or you don't know that much about SVG or something, or you don't know. You know, there's all these things that that like you might just be total gaps in your knowledge, and you're not a special specialist there. So even front end is super wide. But front end traditionally has been, well, there's, you know, the flip side of that is back end, which is that you're working on websites, but not with the visual stuff. You're working with servers and databases and back end languages and things like that. It's kind of the traditional split. And somehow, some way, back end developers are just generally paid more or somehow respected more in technology. And I think that's changing, although maybe not entirely yet, you know. It's changing because front end has proven to be so important and that we're we're always stealing stuff from the back end. And lately, if you're a front ender, and especially if you're new to the industry, you're probably already used to the idea of front end frameworks that are JavaScript powered. I'm talking about React and Angular and Ember and Svelte and all these things. So many websites are that way, particularly if you're trying to be hired, you're going to see job boards that are filled with those words. And those technologies, they do just work in the browser, but so often are they doing some of the work that backend people used to do. So we're like, you know, if you're really good at some of these frameworks, you've, 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 the line is starting to get a little blurry about what exactly is backend and what exactly is front end to the point where if you really have a wide swath of skills in front end, you might not need much backend help at all. I'm thinking about somebody building a website and they're like, you know what, I'm going to spin up, you know, Sanity as my data store and I'm going to use that as a headless API. I'm going to build a site with React and I'm going to use this really clever front end design system on the front. And it's like, oh, all that stuff happened in the browser and you did it all. And it's like, what's what's a back end developer going to do for me? Nothing. You know, (laughs) now that's there's. There's plenty of work, if not just as much or more interesting things happening in the back-end world, too. I'm not trying to diminish anything that back-end developers do, because I work with plenty of them. And if anything, it's a bottleneck at CodePen that we almost need more of that work. So that's not trying to diminish that. I'm just trying to say front-end is is a, this front-end versus back-end stuff is a big deal. It's, it's, just, it's just a lot to think about here. And I'm hoping that, the, you know, the, where it seems to be headed, despite what my hopes is, is that it's it's about the same. They're just different vocations, but they're not treated differently. They're not paid particularly differently. They're just roles that people work on on websites, you know. Yeah, for sure. And, uh, you know, like what you said, and, and you've got a great um, talk that I saw that said, surprise, front-end developers, you're actually back-end developers as well. Um, you know, I think more and more pressure or needing to understand more and more of the whole picture is being required for front end developers. You know, like when I first started learning, if you could code up a site in HTML and CSS, you were golden. But now if you don't know a, a hefty amount of JavaScript, it's it's going to be a little bit difficult to find a job or career in as a front end developer. So What's your encouragement to people who are like, okay, the the game has changed. I need to learn more of this stuff. And they're trying to figure out their way in the midst of that. Uh, you know, one of the things I think of is that you, you, that's probably more in your head than you think it is. And that, and that, you know, like I started this thing talking about being able to write a good email. That still matters. That's never going to change. Your ability to like deal with people and wrangle and organize things is still useful. And even if we're talking about technology, it, it, it seems like it changes, but it doesn't really change that much. Even like you need to get some stuff from a database or some kind of data store and you need to put it in a template and you need to display it on a freaking page. Like the core tenets of that are no different now than they were 10 years ago or whatever else. You know, it's, it's still like how you get it out of the, you know, what the database is, how you get it out of there, how you put it back, all those things, they, they change in like the approach and how smart and intelligent and easy it is or whatever changes. But the core of that is no different. You know, if you came, if somebody came back five years 
years and was learning the system now, they'd be like, I, I learned lots of stuff about getting stuff out of a database, templating it and showing it to users. Then that's still what you're doing now. You know, like you can still, your UX still skills still kind of have hung on there, you know, and everything that you build, it's really about you're doing it for people. You're trying to make good decisions for what the users of that website want to do. So if you always have that in mind, as the technology changes under you, it's almost like you become a watchdog for that. You'd be like, hey, cool new tech, but it really didn't do anything for my users, so I don't care. You know, can what what can this tech do for the people that I'm building this website for? You know, if that's your vibe, who cares what changes under your feet? You know, you're gonna be this this warrior for the users that's gonna just be valuable in anything that you do. Yeah, I, I love that idea. And, you know, I think a lot of times, a lot of the front end developers or web designers that I talk to, they really struggle bridging that gap between what it is that they're good and they're doing at and why it's useful to people who might want to to pay for their services. Um, so, so how do you, how do you keep that in mind? How do you, how do you stay user centric when things can get so nitty gritty into the details? Um, you know, and, and it's really easy to kind of lose your way amidst all the cool new bells and whistles and tricks that come out that yeah. we have to play with. I mean, if you're alone, that's just your own journey. But but you'd think that you can always pull out stuff that will make any team impressed. If you're caring about the users, you can you can you can you can learn some new technology. And be like, look, look, look at how this helps user support. Look at we have this problem in support, and I know because. I talk with some people in support that, that that this is a common problem and I'm going to use this technology to fix that problem for those people. Support's going to be happy with you. I would think the boss of those support people is going to be happy too. Like, oh, this was obviously a good idea. Or you can tie doing a good idea to revenue because that's always there's always going to be a one-to-one with doing right by the user and making more money. So, you know, if you <laughs> tell that to the boss, you know, and hopefully you can just, you can like scratch up some wins along the way. Be like, remember when we did this and that was good for everybody and now we made more money, let's do it again kind of thing. I know that feels a little abstract, but, but I feel like even under pretty difficult situations or moments where you find you've lost your way, that you can always find some way to say, if I'm doing the right thing by the users of this website, that that I can convince myself and other people that that this this is the right way forward. You know, that, that doing some better stuff on on behalf of the users is a guiding light for us. I want to take a second and tell you about a free course that I have available at selfmadewebdesigner.com. Over 1,000 people have been through this course, and I am talking about the Web Designer Starter Kit course. I map out in four videos that you get through email all the steps that I took to get to where I am as a web designer. And I went from knowing absolutely nothing. I, I was clueless to, in two years, doubling my income with a freelance web design side hustle. I made this because I know you can be successful doing the same thing. And the Web Designer Starter Kit course is the first step for you on your journey to being a successful, thriving freelance web designer or having a full-time career. So I can't wait for you to check it out. Go to selfmadewebdesigner.com and sign up today. So you've you've been working from home for quite a long time now, and you've also had multiple projects going on at the same time. And I think a lot of the world is beginning to work from home if they haven't been doing it. Um, and they're finding themselves having to transition between clear boundaries between work and the place that they eat their food and sleep and, and take showers. And it, I think a lot of people are finding it a little bit difficult. Um, and so, you know, how, how have you been able to maintain a healthy, productive uh, workflow and everything that you're doing while working from home and still jugg juggling all the things that you do? I mean, I, right right now, I just cheat, you know, like I, I, I'm lucky in that I don't actually work from home. I work from an office. I'm here at my office and the office is just me. 
you know, with my closed door over there. So I'm not like endangering the world by being here and it gets me out of the house. So there's that going on. I haven't always had that. You're, you're right. I have worked from home for mo- most of the time. So uh, there's that. You know, the, you know, the number one thing that I hear people saying over and over about this is that this isn't like, <laughs> this isn't normal remote work. You know, like you're working from home right now, but this isn't like a, a, a real trial run. Like there's just too much crap going on right now to, to be like that you either like or don't like working from home or remote work in general based on this experience because the main experience right now is that of worry and dread and <laughs> all kinds of crap going on right now so so if you're you know if you're if you're looking to be highly productive right now that's cool but you know <laughs> you know, if you don't hit that bar, I wouldn't hold it against you at the moment. You know, a little, a little crazy right now. Uh, so, so don't worry about that too much. You know, I'm, I feel like I'm under the bar of productivity at the moment, you know, not at, not at my best, certainly. Uh, some good things are happening. And, and sometimes when I do have a moment of good productivity, it's because, it's because I'm burying my head in it because I'm like, I, you know, I just this is this is a good distraction that I if I can get into some kind of flow state that I can just be worried about that and not be worried about whatever else I could and should or what the world wants me to be worried about. Yeah, that's great. And I uh, totally resonate with being under the bar. I think I'm a, a few notches <laughs> under the bar for productivity. Um, so it's 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 uh, affirming to me to hear you say that as well. Um so talk to uh, talk to us a little bit about let's say somebody's got some they're they're starting to feel pretty confident with their HTML CSS a little bit of JavaScript they've built some websites and now they're starting to look at either freelancing as a web designer or maybe jump into a career so what's what's the optimal path for that if if there is one altogether. Um, you know, I, th- I think I, I think I'm stealing this from Mike Montero, who's, who's, who's I think general advice has been if you're like brand new to the industry, you've never worked for a shop ever, a product or a agency or anything, and you're wondering, should I go do that or should I just go off on my own? But the answer should be you should work for a shop first. You should get the experience of working under people and with people and for clients and that, and just have that experience before you and before you decide that oh, I'm just going to go this on my own. And then if you, then if later you feel like I could do this on my own or I want to do this on my own, that you could then go do it. But you're just gonna you're gonna have a better time of it if you work for somebody first or work for multiple people first. And I kind of believe that. I mean, it happened to be my path, so I'm probably predisposed. Exposed to to liking, but I just feel like if you just if you've only ever been alone, like your like the your like growth path is going to be a little limited. That like you're only you haven't really built a network outside of this. You've never really experienced like how other people handle clients and handle tough situations and stuff like your toolbox for things to reach for freelancing is, is just smaller than, than if you've, if you've jumped into the, uh, like an agency world for a while first, I've done it both sides. I've worked for, I've never been a full-time freelancer, but I've worked for a small agencies where we did client work and I've worked for, uh, products, you know, where we're making web apps and those were both, you know, distinctly different experiences. And then I've worked for myself in terms of like just having having CSS tricks and, and stuff. And and now I'm kind of a boss, you know. So that's a, a different experience as well. But I think the the breadth of my experiences does help. Speak a little bit to the future of front end development. What do you, what trends do you see happening coming down the pike, and where should people be looking in the next five years? Uh, I think this 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 model of working in components is relatively new to front end development, and that certainly in like the, the bulk of my early career of building websites, we used templates, you know, and we used HTML and CSS and piece things together in different ways. But it wasn't largely about components. It wasn't like this is my input component, which is a search component, which is, you know, then goes in a header component and I and I piece things together from this, like what do I need on this particular website? 
and the new the, the arrival of JavaScript frameworks and design systems, which is another kind of big topic, has said like let's think about things in these like discrete componentized chunks. Uh, uh, and that's just going to stick. I think that's kind of proving out to be the the real like model, like the correct primitive, as they say, of, of, of front end development. So I think things will catch up to that that aren't doing it in that way. Like, for example, I work on a bunch of WordPress sites. I feel like that that concept of just having a handful of templates to work from is going to start to fall away and not really be the right way. And then maybe that, that however this component things plays out, some it'll it'll be the it'll be the way. Now every front end framework agrees with that. Every, you know, use Vue or Angular or React or anything. They're all like, well, yeah, you build from components, and and new ones come along like Svelte, and they're like, ah, oh, we have a totally different approach, but it's still components. You know, like the native web platform has been working on web components for a long time. So even if you're not using a framework, you're just using native web technologies. It's moving towards components. Like everything is moving towards this concept of components. So I think that's a a smart way to think. And it makes you work well with just straight up designers too, because designers like to think and build componentized systems. Uh, so I, I just think that's a, that's kind of a, a big deal of it all. And it seems like the, of all the big trends, it's kind of like a, the, the, the jam stack thing seems to be the biggest, the biggest like sea change, which is the, just the concept of pre-building as much of the site as you can, like still using the tools that you're comfortable with. You perhaps you're still using a JavaScript framework. You're still using a CMS of some, some kind. You're still using a lot of the tools that you use, but the output of that ends up being as much pre-rendered as you possibly can. And so I think, uh, uh, I think everything is moving towards that. All kinds of different, everybody is, is, is trying to make pre-rendered stuff because it's just proving out that it's so fast and so resilient and it's just such a good way to go. So I, I wonder as, as we just kind of close things, um, this might be kind of a, a cheesy question, um, but uh, if you just had one thing to encourage web designers with, wh- what would you say to them? Even during the one of the worst things that can ever happen to the world, which is this stupid virus, somehow our industry is okay for now, you know? It's been resilient a bit, you know? Like, all in all, less web designers are losing their jobs than florists, you know? Thank gosh for us, you know? Sorry, sorry, florists, you got a bad cut there, you know? But isn't that kind of cool? Isn't that kind of encouraging? Isn't it kind of nice that technology hangs on, that that during this sucky time, the technology is helping people still? It's helping us be less bored. It's helping us be more connected. It's helping us continue to do other jobs. It's, you know, it's helping the healthcare system. It's, hel- it's all this stuff. It's still important. And it's, in my opinion, the most important thing that human beings have ever done is basically the internet, the World Wide Web. It's connected more people. It's it's skyrocketed intelligence and being able to work together and connect people that need to be connected. We've never done anything this cool. You know, it's like, thanks, URLs. You did a good job. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, one more time, can you tell uh, tell our listeners where they might be able to find you? Sure, yeah. My name is Chris Coyer, C-O-Y-I-E-R is the spelling of my last name, which is uh, my name.net. Chris Coyer.net is my personal website, which I love it when people have those so I can follow just you and your thoughts and what you're up to and what you work on. Um, that's what I do, and I have one of those. So you can go there and find, if you're interested in following me on whatever social media and stuff, I have links to all that stuff there. There. And the things that I work on and want you to do, I literally have a section that says, here's some stuff I want you to do. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, thanks again for being with us. Really appreciate you taking the time, Chris. Yeah, cheers. Thanks. Man, such awesome thoughts and insight from Chris. Chris is the kind of guy, you start talking to him and you instantly realize this guy is much smarter than I am. And it was awesome to pick his brain and to get some insight. And I'm sure that you benefited from it as well. Hey, have you left a review for the Self Made Web Designer podcast? I want to encourage you to do that. By doing that, it helps other people find this podcast 
and hopefully help them figure out how to be self-made web designers as well. So take a second, do that, and get ready because next week, another episode is coming. We have a fantastic guest. Her name is Jessica Gaddis. And Jessica has worked at places like Netflix and she's currently working at Twitter. She is a self-taught UX designer and she's gonna tell you how to do the same thing. And I know that it's gonna be awesome. You're not gonna wanna miss out on that episode. We will see you next week. 12 a.m. midnight is when the episode drops. Until then, fare thee well.